Hello everybody, welcome. Well, as you can see, I've got a new camera, so hooray for the upgrade. And uh, hopefully this goes well. The idea is to give a bit of an improvement to the visuals on my videos going forward here. I'm gonna tell a bit of a story, and this is actually one of the best adventures I think I've ever created and ever run in all my years of being a GM. One thing that you don't see a lot of in D&D creatures are celestials. They're not a very common creature type, and it's not a type of monster that the characters generally get into encounters with. I made a Celestials ranking video a few years back and I even talked about that. The few amount of Celestials that we do have are really cool monsters. They have a lot going on and in general, there's some pretty high quality monsters. The reason there aren't a lot of Celestials is pretty obvious in that the characters more often than not are fighting against evil things or maybe fighting against neutral things. And I know technically Celestials could be neutral or evil, but a lot of times when we think of Celestials, we think of things like angels and angels aren't usually something that you fight against. Angels maybe are someone that you're working with, or maybe you even can summon in angels to help you fight against terrible, evil monsters. I created an adventure called The Temple of Brilliant Souls, and this was for a campaign of mine called Heroes of Verland way back in the 4E days. I actually made a YouTube video about the Temple of Brilliant Souls. You can go watch the visual bit of it if you're interested. I released it like in 2011. So uh, yeah, I've been at this for a while and it's a little bit more rudimentary of a video, but uh, I think it's still worth checking out if you're interested. I'll put the link down in the video description. This was a long, epic campaign, went all the way from first level to 30th level. 4E had 30 levels and this particular adventure took place at 24th level. The final villain of this campaign was the demon lord Orcus, and that's who the characters eventually went on to fight. One thing that they needed to help win their ultimate victory against Orcus was a weapon, a powerful artifact created by the god Moradin that he had sealed away long ago in this astral plane warded mega vault called the Temple of Brilliant Souls, and there was a lot of history and lore connected to this, this location. The party sails through the astral plane and arrives at the Temple of Brilliant Souls, and it is a grand, majestic, celestial-type dungeon. There are a number of different challenges and tests that they have to go through in this dungeon. The first one they encounter is called the Test of Virtue, where there are these angel-like magical statues and big magical sigil or magic circle that tested their virtue, their alignments. This powerful ward at the very entrance would allow good aligned creatures to pass right through. Evil creatures would get banished or even disintegrated and neutral characters would have to go through a sort of personal inner test, a skill challenge essentially to prove themselves or to find it within themselves to summon their best qualities. And there was some danger with it, but the characters, all good aligned and neutral aligned, were able to pass the test of virtue. Second, the first chamber properly inside the temple was the test of strength. And what kind of creature did they encounter? Lo and behold, an angel. What I called an archangel back then, we'd probably call that a planetar or even maybe even a solar in 5e terms. Being that a god, a greater god at that, Morden had constructed this site, he had actually set it up to where these sorts of angels would be summoned in to fight those who attempted to pass through the temple and they would have to prove themselves. So it was an effective way for the characters who were good aligned or at least on the side of fighting against evil to fight against angels, angels who were agents of a lawful good deity, no less, and it still be morally appropriate or they could still reconcile or there's a good reason why. It was a summoned celestial, they fought it and when it was defeated, it was dematerialized and went back to Celestia. They succeeded in the combat against the Archangel and there were two main ways to go. They inspected one way and it led to an astral projection chamber. Also just north of the astral projection chamber was a sub chamber that had these braziers, um, unlit, unlit braziers. The party engaged in a skill challenge trying to figure out how to activate and utilize the astral projection chamber, but they failed. They couldn't figure it out. So they went back to the other side. They took the other corridor and went into the main section of the dungeon. Well, things got really interesting here. The first thing they saw was a massive seal, like a giant stone seal blocking the way northward. Morden himself had set it in place and put divine wards on it. They tested it and there was no way they were getting through that seal. There was this massive corridor that then led to a, a big chamber and then adjoining chambers. Most of the adjoining chambers 
were shut by smaller seals, uh, kind of medium size or large size versions of that big one. And they knew that behind the big one was the weapon they were after, this artifact warhammer that was going to be crucial in the fight against Orcus. Again, there's a lot of history and lore behind this place. I'm skipping past that for the sake of time. What made this adventure particularly complex and very elaborate was that I actually used a bunch of props. One thing I constructed was this uh, cylinder that had a flashlight inside of it, like a small, bright LED flashlight. And the characters found a way that using a, um, a sort of magical control panel, they could slowly rotate this uh, cylindrical um, bit there in the middle of this big hall and therefore move the um, this light. Of course, in the actual D&D world, this was this brilliant, magical beam of light. They could turn it on and they could turn it off. And we were playing at the kitchen table, and whenever they activated the magical light in the dungeon, I would actually shut off all the lights in the house. It'd be totally dark except for candlelight and this beam of this LED flashlight beaming out of this central cylinder. There were a number of different chambers that had different kinds of puzzles, magical traps, and even more summoned creatures. There was uh, more summoned angels. There were these powerful epic spells like um, living spells, but really high level spells. They were called apocalypse spells in 4E that got summoned. So they had some really brutal battles. Every time they solved one of the chambers, be it the combat encounter, the puzzle, the magical traps, a mirror would come up, like this big, beautiful, gleaming mirror would come up out of the floor of the temple and I actually used these little highly reflective mounted mirrors, like little rectangular shaped mirrors that I made bases for. The way that that central cylinder initially was oriented, they couldn't actually make the beam of light hit any of those smaller seals. But they suspected that that was how they would open up the, the, the minor seals or the secondary seals. Aha, well, once that first mirror came up from the ground, they were able to shine the beam onto the mirror and they could rotate the mirror pretty quickly. It was just one action to rotate the mirror in any direction. Again, I would shut off the lights in the apartment and it worked. The actual beam of LED light reflecting off that mirror created a second beam that they could change the angle of it and beam it around. And they struck one of those smaller seals, opened up another chamber, solved that chamber's puzzle or encounter or whatever it had inside of there. The next mirror rose up in a different section of that main hall and they were able to bounce this this beam of light back and forth. And it was really cool because the players got to physically manipulate these mirrors and lights and have this, this um, reflecting beam effect uh, across the, the battle map. One of the chambers that they went into had this big like crystalline obelisk and it was missing a piece. And they knew that previously this place had been assaulted by a um, powerful outsider, let's say. They got some more clues about how to successfully use that astral projection chamber. So they ended up going back to that chamber and successfully astral projecting themselves onto a different plane, a dimmy plane, like this ruined crystalline husk or chunk floating in the far reaches of the void. And they encountered an atropal and these greater flame skulls. And upon defeating those really nasty and evil creatures, they recovered the missing shard from that big crystalline obelisk. They went back to their bodies into the Temple of Brilliant Souls. My memory's a bit vague on this part. I remember that that brazier chamber, they lit the flames of different colors, like all the colors of the rainbow. Aha, yes, this was key. So they managed to light these braziers. Each flame was a different color of the rainbow. They combined together to make this pure white light that gave them something. It was some piece or some key that they used to solve one of the puzzles back in the main hall. There's a lot going on in this adventure, so I hope this is making sense. So the final chamber that they had to solve in the main hall had these two like big pillars with like blades of light traps and then these statues of, of archer angels that would shoot arrows of light at them. It was a really powerful uh, divine trap chamber but they solved it. They, they were able to, to find the solution to the traps and defeat the traps. And when they did, the archer angels reoriented their bows and they all shot their, their arrows together uh, onto this mosaic in the ceiling. And it outlined this form of like a prism. And they went back to that great corridor attached to the main hall. 
and from the floor arose this big crystalline prism. And I literally used a prism that I'd got at a crafting store. They angled the cylinder once again, shining the beam of light straight through the prism, which cast this beautiful rainbow band of light onto the great seal, thus opening it. They recovered the artifact and the adventure was a great success. They eventually went on to defeat Orcus, by the way. So that was a really cool way to use angels and good aligned gods and creations of good aligned gods as a test, a location that is a secured, warded place that the gods would be okay if the right heroes would go there and, and claim the, the magic item or claim whatever important object or elixir or knowledge that is, that is protected there, that is safeguarded there. The only thing that kind of bums me out a little bit when I think back about this adventure was that actually all the players really were griping and groaning and complaining a lot throughout it. Um, I've never had so many complaints. It was kind of fouling the mood at times at the table. It just goes to show that all the props in the world and really cool adventure design can't make people happy. And really getting the attitude right and the tone right is so important. And the GM really is the most responsible for that. The, the, the leader who's the most accountable. So, you know, maybe I had given them a hard time about something or was like a super stingy with some of the game rules. I don't remember what I did wrong. But that's a lesson that I'll always remember, uh, especially when it's an adventure that I've prepped a lot to, um, to make sure I do my best to encourage and inspire and keep the, the attitude good at the table. And in the end, if the players still have a bad attitude or just aren't really contributing much to it, maybe they're not the right players. Maybe this isn't the game for them. Maybe your personalities don't match. Maybe they're just ungrateful. So there you have it. You can use angels and they can even fight against good aligned parties. You probably just don't want them to be literally fighting them to the death, but more like summoned in as tests. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you especially to everyone who supports me over on Patreon. If you are interested in checking out the Patreon, there's a link down in the video description. It helps support this channel. It helps stabilize my channel. If you enjoy this type of content, that's something you can do to, uh, to contribute. And you get some really cool rewards along with it, some exclusive things that I release every single month. Uh, so check that out. Thanks everyone. I'll see you all in the next video sometime before too long. As always, May your adventures be many.